comfortable with their kind of at-home setup, right? And I think one of the biggest things that that brought about was the comfort with having a second screen, yeah. right? And so it's how can you, you know, from a live uh, standpoint, you know, it's how can you essentially integrate that second screen for your, you know, for your ticket buyers, right. uh, but then still not distract from the main event, right? Because one thing you don't want, especially as, you know, the TV camera, you know, panning to the stands and everyone is just looking at their phones. <laughs> so I think that, I think being able to bridge the gap between the in venue and at Hi everyone and welcome back to the Sporting Global Podcast. And today I'm here with Nigel Davis. And Nigel, first of all, thanks for taking the time. How's how's life these days? Oh no, appreciate you having me on. Uh, life is good, you know. Just uh, busy, uh, busy, but working, you know, with some really cool, you know, technology and workflows within the broadcast space. So um, you know, still, it's uh, definitely exciting to get out of bed every morning and, and work <laughs> for the company. So awesome. yeah, and yourself. No, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's it's obviously great to have you here, and, and for those of you that are you know tuning in, and me and Nig Nigel, we have a little bit of a history as well. So it's good to see your face again. I mean, like even if it's digital, digital, and at some point, of course, we'll we'll, we'll meet face to face when I'm back in the U.S. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Awesome. Yeah. So I mean, like pretty much just gonna dive right into it. You know, just why don't you why don't you share a little bit about how you you started your career in the industry. Just take a little bit from from scratch and and go a little bit through your journey so far. Yeah, sure. No, and, and happy to do so. I mean, for me, you know, I was a collegiate athlete, you know, through shot put at, at UCLA. So, you know, growing up in and especially in Los Angeles, you know, growing up in such a saturated professional sports and, and collegiate sports market, you know, sports for me was always a primary interest, right? And so I always knew you know, going through, you know, going through university and, and the like, I mean, I always knew I wanted to work in sports, right? So it's kind of how do I, how do I get there? And, you know, I think for me, it was really key that I started volunteering, you know, in college over the summers at, um, at UCLA. And so basically what UCLA had, which was really interesting, was that, you know, a lot of the European soccer teams would come, or I should say soccer clubs, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, the clubs would come to to Los Angeles to do their preseason uh, tours. Right. And they would, a lot of them would train at UCLA. And so, you know, throwing shot put, I was, uh, I was much larger uh, than I am today. <laughs> so I actually got my start um, volunteering at the training site as, as like a legitimately a bodyguard for a lot of the players, like for the Real Madrid's of the world. And they would wow. go, you know, around campus or into the, into the gym to, to work yeah. out. And I would have to kind of go and accompany them and, <laughs> and make sure that they weren't being bothered. Uh, so right. I did that for about three years. And, and that third year was really when I started to understand, you know, how valuable internships were. Right. right. So I actually then approached the two gentlemen by the name of uh, John Scheiman and, and Starla, Charlie Stilatano, um, who were working at CAA at the time and said, you know, hey, I would love to intern with you guys next summer. Uh, you know, be that in New York, be that in Los Angeles, you know, anything I can do to really just kind of work more with you guys, because I've seen what you've done the past mm -hmm. three summers. And obviously, as a, a you know, a child of a, of a British man, you know, grew up watching and, and loving uh, soccer. So yeah. they then ended up calling me, uh, you know, later that spring and said, hey, you know, we'd love you to move out to New York for the summer and, you know, intern with us. Uh, I had never even been to New York prior to that. So I ended up moving to New York City uh, about a week after I graduated from UCLA, yeah. um, interned with them over the summer, and then was able to turn that into, I'd say just about three and a half, four years of, of working with relevant sports and, and you know, launching and growing the International Champions Cup, uh, which has really now become a staple of the global, you know, the global football calendar. So yeah. great to see that property, you know, still, you know, surviving and, you know, just the the benefits of preseason touring, you know, for those clubs. Sure. And then, you know, following my time with Relevant, you know, I ended up going um, abroad and participated in the FIFA Master program for a year, which was, you know, a great experience and, and definitely learned a lot and, you know, got a, a really unique opportunity to, you know, really live and get to know um you know people from all over the world you know and who have all kind of started some of them you know had been working in sports others had you know wanted to kind of break into the sports market um and so you know and it was really i mean you know jisung park was my classmate right i mean so just growing up as a man united fan right there's not many cooler things than going to class every day and seeing you know this legend that you grew up watching right. and just sitting in the class and you're like hey you know how you doing so so that was that was really you know that was great and then following you know the FIFA master I kind of worked for myself for a little bit and kind of went project by project you know quickly realized uh that 
you know, it's not necessarily the most fun to always continue to have to, you know, look for that next project and continue to kind of, you know, it would give yourself a, a little bit of revenue. So yeah. ended up, you know, a little bit into the pandemic, I got approached uh, by a company called Chiron, um, who nice. are one of the really big, like legacy names in, in broadcast graphics. So, yeah. you know, Chiron was actually the first company to put a live uh, ticker on a mm. news broadcast. Wow. So what they were doing though, which really applied to my sports um, and like live events background was that they needed somebody to manage their in-venue business unit. So I ended up doing, you know, kind of sales and account management for them, um, working with a lot of the biggest, you know, stadiums across um, North America. Wow. And recently, yeah, find myself uh, here at Disguise for for a couple months. So that kind of a quick little tour of, of how, uh, you know, catching you guys up to uh, to where I am now. That's, that's awesome. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, like you, you, I think you're bringing some, some very key things already, you know, volunteering, you know, internships, you know, traveling abroad, all the good stuff we would like to see, you know, to put yourself out there. Uh, and, Absolutely. And of course, you know, I think, I think, you know, learn some hard lessons probably along the way too, and we'll, we'll tackle more of that at the end. But, 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 but first of all, you know, let's, let's dive a little bit into your role now as the director of sports broad broadcasting at Disguise, like talk a little bit about the role, like what are some of your key tasks, some of the responsibilities that you have now? Yeah, sure. So Disguise is a really interesting company, you know, they're very innovative and, and Disguise actually, you know, got its start in tandem, uh, you know, working with uh, U2 uh, to basically mm -hmm. figure out how you can create a, you know, software on hardware platform to be able to help, you know, uh, bands that are doing these huge global tours to essentially have that same experience in every single venue so that right. any fan of whatever, you know, of whatever band around the world can say, I had this exact same experience on this tour. And, it, you know, yeah. and that's kind of how Disguise was born. Mm -hmm. um, so we now, you know, do a lot in the extended reality um, and, you know, kind of mixed reality, augmented reality environments. Okay. Uh, but we also, you know, you utilize Unreal Engine, uh, which is the kind of video game graphics engine by Epic Games. So we're actually part owned by Epic Games as well. So wow. we're, you know, you know, in my role as the director of sports broadcasting, you know, a lot of it is you know, really evangelizing our products and making sure that all of the leading broadcasters are aware of our solutions, uh, you know, and yeah. workflows. Yeah. So from a kind of sales and business development standpoint, you know, I'm always talking to people and, you know, talking to the broadcasters, to the teams about different ways that we can partner and, and work together and really trying to build those, you know, symbiotic relationships, right? And then another key task that I have is also, you know, account management in the sense of, you know, really being the point person for a lot of these, you know, larger broadcasters to kind of come to and making sure that we are actioning on everything from, you know, current hardware and software to, you know, future uh, projects to also just maintaining service level agreements and making sure that they, you know, that everyone is kind of everyone is buttoned up and making sure that everything agreed to, you know, is, is managed properly. Right. Um, so it's a very interesting space, you know, and I think really what we're seeing now within the, you know, the sports, I think, you know, there's a lot of change and, you know, we also do a lot with, uh, you know, with the quote unquote metaverse, right? So, yeah. you know, we just launched a, a metaverse labs uh, as well. And they're doing some really, really innovative, you know, kind of, you know, virtual events, but tied to a physical space. Right. So, you know, I'm really happy to be here. And, and like I said, you know, I think with what we, you know, have been doing, you know, everything from, you know, film and TV to concerts to virtual production, you know, I think we're really um, on the pulse of, of the innovation within the market. That's awesome. I mean, like, obviously, you know, put pandemic, you know, brought a lot of innovation and obviously, you know, it's creating a lot of possibilities and opportunities in, in, in the space and sp specifically the sports market. And, and talk a little bit about, obviously, you mentioned kind of disguises involvement in, in different kind of sector, but, but, but especially in terms of the sports market, like what, what is the role exactly of disguise there? And, and what are some cases you've worked on so far? And, and a little bit about like, how do you, you know these these partners and clients of yours utilize you know both your hardware i guess also also your software yeah yeah absolutely so i think you know when you think about it and i can't get into too many specific projects because a lot of them are are under are under nda but if you think about a broadcast studio right you have a certain number of led you know panels um in the background and and those can be populated with anything from you know static static graphics to live video uh to kind of dynamic uh real-time rendered you know unreal yeah. engine graphics and so what we do is anything really from just you know your basic led control so kind of you know going through your run of show and and putting those up on the leds in your studio yeah. but then we also can take you know we can also create extended reality environments right so mm -hmm. that video that I had posted on LinkedIn with the NBA 2K, you know, that's on um, an 
an LED stage essentially, right? And when you combine the image on the LED stage and you have the tracking on your cameras, you know, you can actually create a fully immersive environment that they can be broadcast in. So yeah. when you think about it, there's a lot of really, you know, cool things that broadcasters can do. You know, if you have a small LED stage, right, it doesn't have to look like a small LED stage live uh, on mm -hmm. broadcast. It can be a fully, you know, immersive world. And that, right. you know, what we can do that's really interesting is we can actually input live data uh, into okay. the extended reality environment. So if you think, you know, from a sports betting standpoint, you know, we've done some projects with broadcasters that, you know, we've built out a full casino environment for their for their TV wow. shows and they have, yeah. you know, betting lines and odds and, you know, constantly <laughs> refreshing in the background. Yeah. Uh, and then on the on the kind of live event side within stadiums, you know, we can do a lot of a lot of projection mapping and, and LED control. And we're also, you know, really close to a couple partnerships that's going to really, you know, drive a fan engagement in a lot of very unique uh, and innovative ways. So, you know, there's, you know, we kind of have that the studio real broadcast side, but then we also do some really cool stuff with within, um, you know, within venues. And, you know, we've done some work, yeah. you know, we've done a lot of work in Europe with some really key venues out there as well. And so it's really just kind of bringing those examples uh, to to the U.S. market and, and you know, just really trying to trying to champion the company and get us into as many, you know, as many places as possible. Right. Well, I mean, like it's definitely the market to be in, you know, the Americans love innovation technology and especially how to utilize that for their fan engagement and fan behavior. Right. So especially yeah. now, I think, you know, with the pandemic, everything, you know, coming in in terms of, you know, both, uh, you know, just just the requirements, right, of what people have, the expectations people are having, it's just, you know, probably elevated many bars, you know, uh, through the pandemic. Right. Because suddenly yeah. you know, everything is going digitally. Everything is, you know, kind of you know, it's, it's just harder also in a sense to get people out of their, their homes, I think in a, in many ways too, you yeah. kind of became comfortable in your bubble. Right. And so yeah, absolutely, you had to move fast. And, and I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, especially through this time, right? Like what are some trends you've seen in the sports broadcasting market? And, and especially like, what has some been like, I, I guess some key elements during uh, the pandemic that have kind of changed it up a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one thing that you just kind of you kind of touched on, right, where, you know, everyone got a lot more comfortable with their kind of at home setup. Right. And I think one of the biggest things that that brought about was the comfort with having a second screen. Yeah. Right. And so it's how can you, you know, from a live uh, standpoint, you know, it's how can you essentially integrate that second screen for your, you know, for your ticket buyers. Uh, but then still not distract from the main event, right? Because one thing you don't want, especially as, you know, the TV camera, you know, panning to the stands and everyone is just looking at their phones. <laughs> so I think that I think being able to bridge the gap between the in venue and at home experience has been something that has become, you know, quite challenging. Um, but, you know, another flip side of that, as we've seen, especially recently, is that there's never been more of a demand for live events, right? I think people are starting to say, hey, you know, we've been We've been cooped up for you know a while and so it's like why would we not want to go see a game live right. so right. i think it's it's you know that it, it's still you know everyone i think is still trying to work out that second screen but you know it yeah. hasn't i think i think it hasn't impacted you know ticket sales as much as people maybe had been originally you know kind of you know the fearing but right. and then i think you know as far as really trends within the within the broadcast market itself is i think one of the really interesting things we've seen recently and and it plays well to what disguise is doing is that you know unreal engine has really emerged as a kind of first choice graphics engine for for right. for broadcasters and, and for creatives so within that as well you can do a lot more with unreal engine as far as you know extended reality and augmented reality and it becomes a much more it's a you know, as you build video game environments in with Unreal Engine, you know, you can do a lot of very difficult, you know, environments quite easily with Un Unreal Engine. So, and they're also working on, you know, developing a tool within Unreal that makes it a lot easier to also do the kind of two-dimensional, your traditional broadcast graphics. You know, you think mm -hmm. your, your lower thirds, your tickers, you know, L bars, anything along those lines. So, you know, yeah. really, I think Unreal has been quite a key trend. Uh, but then also, you know, you hit the nail on the head, right, with the pandemic, right? A lot of things had to go cloud-based. A lot of things had to go remote. And a lot of that just centered around the fact that there were so many restrictions around how many people you could have in a control room at any given time. Mm -hmm. And really, that's, you know, one of the things that really made Disguise pivot to extended reality when it came, 
you right. know, when the pandemic hit and a lot of that was done within film and TV, right? Because all of a sudden you have these restrictions on travel, you have restrictions on how many people can be in a, you know, in a room at any given time. Yeah. So when you substitute all of that travel and you have, you know, a large LED stage and you can create essentially any world uh, or be anywhere in the world, you know, with very cinematic quality backgrounds, all built in Unreal Engine, yeah. you know, it became a very good solution for, for a lot of broad, you know, for a lot of uh, studios and so really then that kind of trickles down into you know the broadcasters as well right oh it makes it makes total sense that i mean like I, i've seen some videos on unreal engine 5 <laughs> some, uh, yep. some amazing te technology that is coming up and uh, i mean like you know it, it's just amazing to see you know the realistic aspect of what it looks like these days so a lot of a lot of potential of course and then it's just knowing how to utilize it and and you know making it as a as an asset right at the end of the day and not just kind of okay it's technology and innovation but how do we actually you know create create valuable uh, environments around it as you were talking about um and yep. obviously you know talking a little bit about you know going down more closer here to the end uh, a little bit about some some lessons that you brought with you you know in your current role from your time at, at chiron and, and and you know traveling abroad and stuff like that like what have been some things that you've seen and 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 learned along the way that that you're now kind of utilizing in your role at disguise yeah i think you know well going back to traveling abroad right i think that's really beneficial and just kind of having you know you learn how to relate and connect with people that are from di very different backgrounds as you right and so especially you know in a sales role where you know you have to go in and have conversations and really connect with people you know right. that kind of experience for me yeah. and even going back to you know relevant sports in the international champions cup you know working yeah. with teams from from greece from portugal from england from italy you know it's like you always <laughs> have a kind of different you know there's a different way that people operate and there's a different way that people work right so you kind of yeah. really have to become accustomed to that yeah. uh, and so you can really apply those lessons too and it might not be something as extreme as you know coming from completely different parts of the world right. but you know every client is different and they all have a different way of operating. And so you kind of become more attuned and accustomed to, you know, being able to identify those things that are going to really help you kind of become more relatable uh, to them. But then, you know, specifically with Chiron, I think, and we kind of chatted on this a little bit before we started, you know, the, the recording, but, you know, one of the biggest things I had to learn really with Chiron was that, you know, you can go direct to a client as much as you want, but it's, it's, it's really the part, the channel partners uh, that you can kind of onboard and and have working in tandem with you, right? And that's really yeah. going to be where you're going to really start to to really grow some grow market share. Yeah. Uh, and so being able to not only have the conversations directly with the clients, but then also kind of having these conversations with channel partners and being yeah. able to, you know, for lack of a better term, to arm them with the right resources that they're going to go right. to their clients and say, you know, yeah. hey, we've been doing, you know, X, Y, Z. Now we have this solution from the skies. We like it. You know, we think it's worth the top conversation. And then just making sure that you're taking advantage of those conversations and, yeah. you know, putting together a solution that's going to really not only, you know, help the company you're working for in the sense of, you know, with your own goals in the sales seat, but then also creating really valuable partnerships and, and really symbiotic partnerships uh, that, you know, you, your clients are going to say, wow, you know, we've done all these things with this system and, you know, then they can start, you know, and, and sports is really, it's funny in sports, it's very much a domino effect, right? If you get the right kind of solution in front of the right people and they really utilize it, then other people are going to see it and go, okay, well, we want to do that too. Right. So, right. and, and, you know, and I think, you know, Chiron in itself was, you know, my first role within broadcasting, right? right. So really that was, I mean, just learning the, learning the hardware, learning about, you know, video paths and, and how the different, you know, vendors, yeah. um, you know, hardware and software can work together in a control room. And, and really just learning that full ecosystem was something that, you know, it's not, so it's not only just knowing your products that you're selling, but it's also being able to speak to other products as well and say, okay, well, if you wanted to use this in tandem with another vendor, kind of here's how that would look. And so really for me, it was, a, it was, you know, oh, okay. Like, so I not only, you know, it was a much bigger, um, you know, the, the scope of what you had to understand was much larger than I kind of originally had anticipated. So, but right. then, you know, but getting that role with Chiron and, and the visibility I had and the responsibilities I had there, you know, was also, you know, really invaluable for me, you know, because I was, you know, interfacing directly with the C-suite, you know, weekly. And so just kind of having that visibility within the company as well was also a real big lesson for me because you have to bring 
you know, you can't go into meetings with people like that, not prepared, right? So even when you're doing your day-to-day responsibilities and, you know, you're doing your selling, your account management, and then your resource allocation, yep. you know, you then also have to prepare and make sure that you are presenting in a very, you know, streamlined fashion and being able to speak to your budgets and and forecasts. So, yep. you know, really that that experience there, you know, it really was invaluable for me. And, you know, I, I'm very grateful that I had it. Absolutely. No, it makes, it makes total sense. And I'm sure it put kind of like a, a benchmark of, of, how you're, you know, working today with this guy. And you know, you're just knowing kind of like that, uh, you know, relationship factors and the stakeholders and all this you were talking about, right? Of, of, yeah, it's not just about building those relationships with the potential clients, but with all these different stakeholders and, and broadcasters uh, involved in this, right? To, to kind of like create your own, how, how can I say, almost like ecosystem, right? Around it. Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a great way of putting it. And, and, and I mean, like, I, I think, you know, obviously, you know, uh, one of the, one of the key things we, 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 we touch a lot upon is obviously, you know, kind of talking a little bit about tips, right. That we wanted to have for, for students that want to work in the sport industry. but, but I wanted to, I want you to kind of like talk a little bit about tips around sales, because I think sales is one of the areas where people are a bit, bit afraid. They're a little bit, you know, often kind of skeptic in, in, into sales. And I think it's a very important thing to talk about. So mm-hmm from your side and you know working with sales and kind of like in the industry now for for quite some time you know especially in sales and and all this like what are some tips you have for for students young professionals that you know want to get into the industry like and talk a little about you know how sales and 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 then that kind of angle could could be a great opportunity for for a lot of people yeah no and and i think you know, there's certain parts about sales right that it goes down to to someone's personality you know so i don't think you know, just to be completely honest, I don't think sales is for, for everyone, 100%. you know, but I, I do, you know, there's certain things in sales that I, and honestly, with my time at Chiron, you know, that I had learned was, yeah. you know, sometimes when you're working on huge deals, right. And you see the numbers that you're yeah. proposing and you just think, oh my God, you know, this is so much money. <laughs> but one thing you really have to be able to separate yourself from is it's not like your money. It's not my money, right. These yeah. companies have, a, you know, it's not it's not like a one for one scale right so once you can kind of become accustomed to not being you know kind of personally wowed by by the the cost of some things you know that becomes very helpful because then you can speak a lot more you know um objectively uh, to the price and to say and but it's also not only that but it's also this is another thing i learned you know before chiron was that you know in sales it's a, it's a phrase that i love is that you know closed mouths don't get fed so you have to be okay with asking questions and asking for those opportunities to get in front of people and present, right. you know, but I do think, you know, for what it's worth, I think that, you know, starting in sales or, you know, working, you know, for, you know, a time in sales can set you up to do several other things as well. Yeah. And it's really, you know, and, yeah. and one of the tips, you know, I think that's really key in the sports industry is that, you know, you're not always going to get the role you want at yeah. first right and so it's really about building up a skill set and being a sponge and being you know really multifunctional in a sense to say hey yeah you know i might not have done marketing but you know i in sales i worked very closely with marketing on what kind of unique selling points we have and yeah. how we essentially you know get those out to the market or you could go theoretically more into just you know pure account management as well which also has an element of sales to it but you're not, you know, kind of just constantly calling and hitting the pavement yeah. and, you know, evangelizing those products. And, but I think one of the things that I tell people most, and, you know, so many, and, you know, can so many people always just say, oh my God, you know, I love working. I would love to work in sports or I would love to do this. And they're, you know, they've already started working in, in other spaces. And I just think that, you know, people have to really be prepared and understand the the level of commitment it takes to work in, in this space. And, you know, the hours of, of working in sports, right? You know, if you have a client that has a game on the weekend and something goes wrong, you better be able to answer your phone, you know, at 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. on a Saturday night and and handle the issue, right? And so I think a lot of people, you know, they say, oh my God, like sports, I want to do it. And it's like, okay, but, you know, there's a lot of caveats to that, right? And it's not a similar life. It's not a nine to five, you know, it's not a Monday to Friday. It's a, it's a Sunday to Sunday kind of job, you know, so- I think, you know, from, from a sales standpoint, you know, I would say just, you have to be confident. You have to understand, you have to go and prepare to every meeting you have. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's just about, you know, and I think sales and, and account management, especially in the sports space is just, 
you know, it really boils down to how do you treat people? You know, how do you treat your clients? How do you interact with people? You know, do you go to bat for your clients? Do you, can you help them out here or there? You know, and I think that once you really start building that relationship, it's just about consistently showing up and, and consistently being that, you know, and not being a transactional resource, but becoming that, you know, consultative resource to your clients as well, where they come to you with ideas and say, okay, we want to do this. How can we do that? And then it's like, okay, you know, great. Like, let's have this conversation. Let's bring in the right people and yeah. knowing when to bring in the right resources as well is also key. Yeah, no, 100%. And I'm, I mean, like, I, I know I angled that kind of tip tip question for you a bit bit much but if there is anything else you wanted to add on at a more general level you know you're yeah. you're, you're, you're free to do something. i think so i think so much of sports too is 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 networking and and who you know right sports you know to me is a very tough industry to kind of just you know apply to positions uh you know online or, or you see an opening you put your resume in because so many people are doing that right? right so it's essentially it's networking it's attending events to be already kind of be able to separate yourself from other, you know, other applicants, uh, and, you know, building those relationships so that when someone says, Oh, Hey, you know, we have an opening because as you know, too, like when people get into sports roles, like it's not, people don't just leave, right. Because you become right. accustomed and you really, you know, and if you love working in sports, you're, you're not yeah. going to want to give up that role. Right. So right. it's about always making sure that, you know, if you have a specific area you want to work in it's about talking to as many people as you can and keeping yourself front of mind so that when things do open up it's right. not a oh i saw this online it's you're getting a call saying hey you know you've been here you've been showing up you've been present you yeah. know we would like to talk to you about this opportunity you know and then you know just kind of really going from there so i think you know within you know whether that's you know a graduate student coming from a sports management master's whether that's an undergraduate program i just think it's just the networking and and like i said earlier you know it's being a sponge and, and being you know multifunctional so that you know you can add value to a lot of different areas that you're working for 100 percent. well it's a, it's a perfect way to to wrap up this podcast and with that nigel you know i would like to thank you so much for for taking the time you know for sharing your your story your insights some some great tips and all the cool things you're working on so you know thanks thanks for taking the time really appreciate it yeah, no, of course, of course. Looking forward to, you know, keeping in touch here and uh, seeing you out in L.A. Uh, in the very near future. <laughs> Absolutely. And for those of you, you know, that have been here all the way at the end, you know, make sure to like the video, subscribe as well so you get weekly tips, you know, from key leaders like Nigel every week for free. Imagine that. Huh? Great. <laughs> uh, so, you know, make sure to do that. And if you haven't, of course, you know, sign up at SportingGlobal.com, you know, as, as Nigel was talking about, you know, build your network, start networking there with the right kind of people, find relevant job opportunities and relevant courses and insights, you know, for in order to help you succeed in the industry. And uh, Nigel, I mean, like, I know we covered a, f a few things here, but, but I do have like one final little I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it like a challenge. It's more like a tradition that we do here at the Sporting sure. Podcast. I have to teach you a little bit Norwegian. That's it. <laughs> okay. Gotta have I'll it. try my best, my friend. Just don't be offended when I get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's going to be fine. So with every video we do, we always finish with vi snakkes, which means see you later in Norwegian. So that's what you have to say. Vi snakkes? There that, you go. Easy. Wow. Yeah. See? Wow. Wow. I'll, I'll be next step is applying for a passport, I think. Awesome. All right. Well done, Nigel. Thank you so much. And we'll talk soon. All right, my friend. Take care of yourself, huh? All right. Thank you. Bye.